let us stand together as we invite the Lord's presence to be with us. Father in heaven, we come before you to give you thanks for all that you have done for us and for the salvation that you so freely offer to each one of us. So as we come before you this morning, we pray the presence of your Holy Spirit will be here to sanctify our hearts and minds that we may return ourselves to you as living sacrifices. That is our duty and our privilege and to give you thanks for all that you have done. So Lord, bless us and may our worship be acceptable to you, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And please remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn number 559, Now Thank We All Our God. speak to us in a very still voice. And this morning, the choir will offer words. This is the very word of the Lord. As the rain and snow come down from the heaven and do not return till they have watered the earth, making it blossom and bear fruit, and giving for seed for sowing and bread to eat, so shall the word come from his mouth prevail. It shall not return to me fruitless without accomplishing my purpose or succeeding in the task I gave it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. This is the word of God.
We'd like to welcome you all to church today. We're glad you're with us. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you. If you have any information you'd like to pass on to the, the pastoral staff, please uh, put it on the little uh, purple card in the pew. A number of important items are in the bulletin today, so please take note of that. Uh, board members, take note that the board meeting is this week, not as normal time. I'd like to request your prayers for a couple families in the church. Uh, Horace Torino has been recovering in the hospital from a serious bout of pneumonia, and things are starting to look up for him. But uh, I'm sad to announce that Gloria McGuire is acutely ill in the hospital, and uh, I want you to remember her and her family. Uh, she's not expected to live more than a few days, so please keep the McGuire family in your prayers. A couple of uh, items for the kids. Uh, note the Christmas party on the 9th. Make sure you respond to that. And uh, the angel tree will be coming up uh, next week. Uh, or next, next week, plan on getting uh, your uh, cards for that. Save the date, December 16th, the Vallejo Drive Church Music Program Christmas Concert. Saturday evening, the 16th, put that on your calendar. It's one of the true highlights of the year for the church. Make sure you plan on that. Well, next Sabbath here at the church is a, a, a special day. We have as our guest speaker for the worship hour, Derek Morris, who happens to be the, currently the president of the Hope Channel. He's also been the editor of Ministry Magazine for the denomination and in the ministerial department at the North American Division. But in addition to him, him preaching for us at church. He will be here with Hope Sabbath School. Many of you have seen this on uh, the Hope Channel. They will be filming it. It'll be uh, live streamed from here, and it will be shown later on the Hope Channel. We have a number of young adults that are going to be up here as part of a panel, some from our church and many from other churches that will be here. So please come early. Okay? I know I'm asking you to do something you normally don't do. But please come nice and early. Be here at 945 because they're going to give the audience a chance to participate as well. So plan on being here next Sabbath for that special day. Thank you very much. Got an extra job today. <laughs> Kids, it's time to come up for the children's story. And while they're coming, that, oh, oh, I forgot another thing, too. Oh, I counted up to old age, huh? <laughs> you know, America's been carving things up uh, this week. And the Vallejo Drive Church has, does its own carving the Sabbath after Thanksgiving. We take it out on these poor pumpkins. So after church, these pumpkins and these squash are all going to be carved up and sent home with you. So please plan on going over to the chapel and take home a bag of, of, of these to use in your own homes. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, that's what I like to hear. I am so happy to be here with you guys. You know why? Because this week we had such a special day. Who knows what that is? What that was? Yes. Very good. Thanksgiving. Did you eat good food at home? Yes. Did you have fun with the family and friends? It was awesome, right? Well, it was Thanksgiving week inside of the ocean. And the fishes were all swimming around. They were all happy, preparing for a big party they were going to have. And all of a sudden, I want to show you who was also getting ready. It was Jack the octopus. Jack was swimming around and looking for oysters because Mr. Jack Octopus loves oysters. And he was swimming back and forth and back and forth. And all of a sudden, he comes to a, a ten small little fish 
they were playing. They were playing right next to you as they were getting ready for Thanksgiving. And he was just watching them. And all of a sudden, 10 fish just whoosh, swim away really fast. And they were running because there was a big, gigantic fish coming after them. And what, do, what does big fish do with the little fish? They eat them. Yes. So all of a sudden, the 10 little fish start running away. And they turn to the right and they turn to the left. And big Jack Octopus was just observing from up. And all of a sudden, he said, you know what? I'm going to help those little, poor little fish. So what he did is with this, all his sucking cups, he went and grabbed the big fish, and all those little fish got away really fast, and they all went away. And once the little fish went away, he just let the big fish go and went swimming around the ocean again. Well, on another day, and all little, the ten little ten fish just swim away really, really fast. All of a sudden, one day, Mr. Octopus saw a oyster. He said, you know what? I am hungry, and I'm going to grab that oyster to eat right now. And as soon as he launched the oyster, he got tangled around some, some weeds in the ocean and, and some rocks, and all of a sudden, all his suction cup were all stuck there, and he couldn't get out, and he was trying to get out. And, and all of a sudden, yeah, my suction, you know how they have all the suction cups on the bottom, right? He got all tangled up, and, and he couldn't get away, and oh no, I'm stuck, what am I going to do? All of a sudden, remember those 10 little fish that he had that he freed? They were swimming by and they were like, oh, look at that octopus, poor octopus, he's stuck. And they were trying to get out and oh, and all of a sudden, one of those 10 little fish came back and he said, I'm going to help Mr. Jack the octopus. Do you know why? Because, yes, Correct, because Mr. Big Jack Octopus helped him escape from the big fish the other day. So one little fish came back and he said, I'm going to help Jack the Octopus. And with his little fins, and he went over there and, and underneath and untangled one and untangled two, three, four. All of a sudden, there were Jack the Octopus was free again. And he swam away. All of a sudden, Jack said, wait a second. How come just you came to help me? And he said, you know, because the other day you helped me. And he said, but I helped 10 of you. How come just, one, just you came back? And he said, because I am thankful to you. You know, in the Bible, we have many stories of people that are thankful. And there are many ways that we can thank someone. We can thank someone by saying, thank you. We can thank someone by saying, by doing something nice to that person. And we can do, we can be thankful by um, doing the same that another person does to us. But the most important thing is that we should always be thankful when someone does something nice to us. Remember that? Big Jack the Octopus was nice and someone was nice to him and he thanked him for what he did. I want all the children ages between 4 to 12 to go to Children's Church, and I will see you next Sabbath. Bye-bye. At this time, I invite the deacons and the deaconesses to come forward for the offering. The offering today is for Camp Cedar Falls. Perhaps you're wondering why I would bring a ceramic white cat to church today with a smudged nose. This cat was painted by my daughter Angela more than 20 years ago at Camp Cedar Falls. Camp Cedar Falls is um, in the Angeles Oaks area. 6,000 feet in the San Bernardino Mountains. It's now in its 76th year of operation. Many, many children have enjoyed summer camp and the activities that are provided for them. 
At this time, the deacons uh, may collect the offering. If you wish to have your offering designated for Camp Cedar Falls, it must be indicated in the envelope. Loose offering is for church budget. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We pray your blessing on Camp Cedar Falls and your children. Amen. Please be seated.
If you have a special prayer request, please come forward. We're going uh, to sing as we come to you in prayer. Please kneel. Dear Father, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for our Vallejo Church family. Thank you for the friends that are visiting today. We've had a special week of celebration with family and friends. And uh, it's easy to remember to be thankful during this week. But I also want to ask you to Help us be thankful after Thanksgiving and be thankful even through the rough times. The people that came up front have something special that they want you to take off their backs. They want you to help them carry a special struggle or burden. Please do that. And the ones that have not stood up but also have something special, you know all our hearts, you know our struggles know the things we worry for so please hold our hand and help us through them help us stay thankful for the little things and for the big things for our family for our friends for the little ones that come up here and smile for the neighbor that decides to bring in our trash cans or for our boss that gave us an extra hour so we can make it to our kids' Christmas party. Help us show the community around us what it means to be a Christian by doing those little things as well ourselves. Please be uh, with pa Pastor Shane today. Help his word touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is found in Luke 17, 11 to 19, and I'll be reading from the NRSV version, and you can follow with me on the screen. Verse 11, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was walking through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. Amen? Yeah. I hope you had a, a great Thanksgiving holiday 
Um, you know, preaching for Thanksgiving is kind of an interesting situation. I thought about uh, what, what to do. Oh, it's, it's the Grateful Samaritan. There was a, a play on the Good Samaritan. I'm, I'm sorry, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, preaching on uh, Thanksgiving, you know, what to, what to do. I feel like there's a really easy sermon that's kind of laid out in front of you to talk about all the things we have to be thankful for, all the things that the Bible says about giving thanks. Uh, we can talk about the physical and psychological benefits of having a grateful spirit and things like that. But uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't really want to preach that kind of sermon. Uh, for one, because I, if, if you've heard me preach before, I, I tend not to preach topically. Uh, you know what I mean by that. Just sort of piecing things together of, of uh, some, some thing that I want to preach about, and then I go and find where the Bible talks about that. See, because I, for me, when that happens, uh, I, I feel like that's, that's not what the worship hour is for, right? That you didn't come here to hear what I have to say about a given subject. But we come together and we read the gospel and we meditate on scripture in the hopes that somehow in doing this we might hear a word from God. So this morning we think of the parable or the story of the ten lepers not because this is maybe the most informative or interesting or even the most inspirational, uh, but that as we hear and meditate on the words of this gospel, that God is present to us in some kind of unique way through the reading and preaching of his word. See, even when we are at our furthest from God, God's word reaches out to us. And that's where the story begins this morning. Jesus, the very word of God, is reaching out to the extremities, to the outer limits. The Bible says on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, the capital city, the home of the temple, the place where God dwells. Jesus is on his way to the center but you see, he begins here on the periphery. He's between Samaria and Galilee. Now, Samaria and Galilee both were known as places of compromised values, of impurity. The Samaritans, as I'm sure you all know, were known as sort of half-Jews. They had apostatized, intermarried with Gentiles, abandoned traditional worship. And the Galileans, by reputation, weren't that much better. Galilee had come to be known as Galilee of the Gentiles. It was a place for outsiders and outcasts. If Jerusalem represents holiness, then Samaria and Galilee represent hypocrisy. They aren't just pagans. They're people who should know better, but they've failed anyways. And it's to these people that Jesus goes out to visit and the Bible goes on to say, as he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Now, any self-respecting Jewish man from Jerusalem would have had no dealings with these Samaritans and Galileans. But now we encounter ten people who not even the Samaritans and Galileans will interact with. That is, these lepers. These ten lepers are the outcasts of the outcasts. You see the point here? That being in Samaria and Galilee is already being on the margins of society. And now Jesus finds himself confronting the people on the margins of the margins. These lepers were quarantined, excommunicated, shunned. For fear of contracting the disease themselves, the village forced the lepers to live separate from the rest of the community. You see, so if Jerusalem represents holiness, that's where Jesus is going, and Samaria represents hypocrisy, then these Samaritan and Galilean lepers represent those who are furthest from God. And I bring this up on a day like today because as we noted at the beginning, on a holiday weekend, a day like today, I'm sure that there are some of us that are in this very position. 
Some of us who came back to church today, perhaps with family, and perhaps this is the first time we've been in church in ages, and we know in our hearts that we are the furthest from holiness that we've ever been. The church has cast us out. Even family has cast us out. Even our closest friends, we've become outcasts of outcasts. The Bible says that as Jesus passed through town, they kept their distance. And I know we do the same thing. I think that's why the seats in the balcony and the seats in the back row are the most popular. Because we like to keep our distance. And if you remember about a year ago, we closed the balcony for one week. It was going to be for a month we were going to close the balcony. We closed the balcony for one week and there was panic. And why is that? Because we like to keep our distance. And I know this because I've done it too, but the further away we sit, we feel maybe less visible. We feel maybe closer to an escape. We feel less confined. We feel a little bit safer if we can just slip in and slip out. But I'll tell you, the church is not a place for keeping your distance. It's a space for reverence, yes, but the church, more than anywhere else, should feel like home. The great picture of the Bible that it paints of God is not a God who keeps his distance. Here we see Jesus in Samaria and Galilee among the lepers, and as the Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And so as Jesus uh, draws near to these lepers, they call out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. If you've ever wondered what it means to draw near to God, this is it. If you've ever felt like praying but you didn't know how, this is it. Throughout the Gospels, this same prayer you may have noticed is echoed again and again from those who are blind, those who are sick, those who are in need. They call out to Christ, and it's always with more or less this, these same words. Have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Sometimes I think we fail to pray because uh, we can't find the words. We don't know what we should say, or we don't have the spiritual energy to say it. Have you felt that way before? You feel like praying, but you don't even know how or where to begin. This is where to begin, with just those simple words, Lord, have mercy. So when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And this is often how Jesus enacts his healings, and we cannot miss the significance of this. I hope this, the point of this is not lost on you. Jesus says, go your, show yourselves to the priests. Why the priest? It's the responsibility of the priest to inspect someone who has already been cured of leprosy to see if the disease is really gone. So when Jesus tells these lepers, go show yourselves to the priests, He's telling them, go and do what you would do if you had already been healed. And this is the opposite of our mindset most of the time, isn't it? Where we say to ourselves, oh, when I get my act together, then I'll start going to church. When I get cleaned up, then I'll come back to God. I'll start praying more once I'm a better person. But Jesus' point is just the opposite of that. Even though these lepers were covered in sores, Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priests. Let them see how clean you are. Now, common sense would have told these lepers that they would first need to actually be clean. But Jesus says, just go. Step out in faith. Even though you look down at your own body and you see arms and legs covered in sores, just start living today as if you are clean, and you will be. And the Bible says that as they went, they were made clean. In the act of faith, they were healed. 
They were made clean because they started living as if they were clean. Even if they look down at their own bodies and saw their own disease, and you may look, look at your own life and see your own inadequacies, but the words of Jesus are to go and have faith and that you will be healed, even if you don't see it in yourself. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. So now finally we come to this theme of thankfulness. Only one of the ten lepers, upon having been healed, returns to give thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Here the author is trying to remind us or trying to show us that this person would have been the most likely to have been looked down upon by the others. He was the one who represents the most extreme case. You see, I'm reminded of the story of the woman who comes into Jesus while he's eating at the table and pours precious ointment on his feet. And the men who are sitting there are, are, are scandalized by this, by this spectacle. What is it that this woman is doing? But Jesus reminds them that her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Our thankfulness, Jesus is saying, is in proportion to the situation that we've been rescued from. You know, Jesus tells a story in that same context. Imagine you have a friend who owes you $5 and a friend who owes you 500 and you cancel both of their debts. Who's going to be more grateful but the one who had the larger debt? So here comes this Samaritan leper who returns to give thanks. But we realize, I think, something important about what's going on here. Because all ten of these lepers had the same disease. All ten were excommunicated. All ten were facing death. The one who was the most thankful was not necessarily the one who was worse off, but the one who recognized the severity of his condition. He recognized how bad off he was. So Jesus asks, were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And now here is what I think is the point. What we can see through this story is that thankfulness ultimately comes from a place of humility. You see the relationship there? You see, we should all be overwhelmed by God's mercy. We should all be bursting at the doors to come and give thanks and praise to God, give Him the worship that is due. But I think we lack that attitude of thanksgiving because of our pride. We don't see the lowness of the condition that God has truly saved us from. So of these ten lepers, it was the one it was the Samaritan who realized just to the limits that God had gone to save him. So what is it that stops us from being thankful? It's our own pride, our own sense of self-sufficiency. We are unaware of our total dependence on God. We take the blessings of life and freedom and mercy and worship. We take them for granted. And meanwhile, it is those Samaritans among us, those of us who, by the looks of it, may be furthest from God, they are the ones who give God right praise. They may be fearful to come to church. They may feel unworthy to be here. They may feel unacceptable. But the point of the gospel is that it is to these types of people that God is eager to listen when we cry out in the simple prayer, Lord, have mercy, God is quick to hear them. 
Jesus tells the story of two men who went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a day. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. So Jesus says to this grateful Samaritan, get up, go on your way, your faith has made you well. And I notice, I think, a kind of terseness, a kind of shortness in Jesus' response here. He just says, get up, go on your way. You see, Jesus doesn't continue to lavish praise on this man. Most importantly, this one man who comes back to give thanks doesn't receive any kind of extra special blessing because he returned. He goes home healed, the same as the other nine. Jesus uh, is not so offended that he wants to revoke his blessing on the nine who didn't give thanks. I wish I hadn't have healed them because of their lack of gratitude. He simply tells this one, get up and go about your life. And so we humble ourselves before God. We thank him for his blessings not because there are some physical or psychological benefits to being a grateful person, not because it, it will win us some favor from God. We do it simply because it is right. We lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. We give thanks to the Lord our God because it is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give thanks to our Father, creator of the world and source of all life. Amen. So as a response of thanksgiving, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn of thanksgiving, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart.
I've given you one more thing to be thankful for. This has to be a record. We're out before 12 o'clock. So happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I want to give uh, the last words for our benediction to the Apostle Paul. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of the Lord. God is faithful, and by him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.